All right, so this short lecture is on the loanable funds model, which, as you remember, is our key model for understanding real interest rates. So that's going to be our focus uh, in some sense, is reviewing this model and, and how it determines the real interest rate. But our other focus, which I put here on the left, is that a lot of your prior knowledge from Act 10A or whatever microeconomics class you took is going to be really important for, for using this model and understanding this model. In particular, it's a supply-demand model. So in terms of labeling, in terms of uh, solving for equilibrium, in terms of you know how shifts are important, all of that prior knowledge from past study of supply and demand is going to be important. Another thing that's important, as you remember, is that there's this distinction between QD, the quantity demanded, which is like a point on the demand curve versus the demand curve as a whole. Right? So when we say demand, we usually mean the demand curve. When we say quantity demanded, we mean the particular point on the curve, like an actual number, like quantity of five. Uh, and similarly with supply versus quantity supplied. And then the third thing I wanted to prime the pump on your prior knowledge is that these graphs are kind of useless when multiple things shift. If there's a demand shift and a supply shift, uh, typically at least one of either the price or the quantity change is ambiguous. We don't know if the price went up or down, or alternatively, maybe we don't know if the quantity went up or down. So you should be expecting that if we have multiple shifts in a loanable funds model, since it's a supply and demand model, maybe some stuff's going to be ambiguous and, and being aware of that. All right. So now let's review how to draw a diagram for our loanable funds model. There's a lot of ways to do this, uh, or there's a couple ways to do this. There's no ambiguity on the vertical axis. You're just going to label that R for real interest rate. But on the horizontal axis, we know that this is, you could call it QLF for the quantity of loanable funds. Alternatively, we know that it is the amount of saving, right? The, the, this model determines the amount of national saving. And alternatively, we know that it determines the amount of investment. And that's kind of weird, because how can it determine two things, savings and investment? Well, we know in equilibrium for a closed economy, savings and investment are equal. So what I like to do is just label this S slash I. It's the, it's the quantity of savings, but it's also the quantity of investment. Um, all right, so now we can go ahead and draw in demand. Again, you could label it D because it's demand, but we know the demand is coming from investment, so I like to just label it I to remind myself that demand is going to shift when stuff that changes investment changes. And then we have S for either supply or savings, but the S here I'm really thinking of national saving, and that's helping to remind me anything that's changing national saving, whether it's the government changing its public saving or its private savers want to save more or save less, is going to shift this savings curve. So now we have our model all set up. We can see that there's an intersection that gives us the equilibrium interest rate. I'll call that R star. It gives us the equilibrium quantity of investment and savings. I'll just label that S star, but it's really also I star. Um, and then finally, let's do the example. So the example described here is that we have an investment tax credit. Uh, this is not a neutral tax credit, as in like they raise taxes on some people and they lower taxes on other people. This is just a big tax cut. It's a big tax. Tax credit just means they give you money back uh, after you pay your taxes. So if you do investments, they give you money back. Uh, and because of that, since they give you the money, you know, they give you money back, you're, you're on net paying less in taxes. So this is going to lower taxes, basically. So the one obvious implication of that is that we're going to have investment shift out. So I'll shift investment out. A whole bunch here. And we have investment shift outward, and this is our new investment curve. But as I said, we were cutting taxes here. So that means the government's public saving is not static, right? If there's less taxes coming in and there's the same amount of government spending, this is going to be a decrease in public saving. So I'll have to shift the S curve too. So now I'll shift it and we get S prime. And now we can see the new equilibrium here. We have a higher interest rate, and we have more saving and more investment, right? Bigger S star star and bigger I star star. And you might be 
now a little confused. How could it be? I said that our saving decreased. I said public saving decreased. The S curve shifted back. How can I now be saying that S star star increased? Equilibrium saving increased. And this is where I wanted to remind you that your prior knowledge is important. Just because you have a decrease in demand doesn't mean there's less quantity demanded. If you have a decrease in demand and an increase in supply, you could have a bigger quantity demanded because there's just so much supply, somebody's got to buy it, and we know quantity demanded and quantity supplied are equal. Well, it's the same thing here. Even though we have supply, our savings shifting back, we have such a big increase in demand in this drawing that our savings still increased because we know savings equals investment and investment is being pushed up so much. So a lot of people just get confused about the terminology thinking if the S curve shift, then S star has to go down. Uh, and we can just see from the graph, and this is why the graphs are so important. That's another, I mean, graphs important. Let me put that down from prior knowledge. You know, the graphs do the work for you, so trust your graphs, um, you know, with caution. There's one exception. And unfortunately, that exception comes up here, which is that as you remember, when there's two shifts, stuff can be ambiguous. So I see two shifts on this diagram. I should be worried that I maybe can't trust this diagram because there's multiple shifts. Uh, and, that, and that it's possible that I could draw a similar diagram with two shifts that gives me a different outcome. And let's go ahead and draw that diagram so we can compare the two and see what conclusion is correct, unambiguous, and which correction is, is kind of depends on the drawing and is ambiguous. So we'll draw it out. We have our original savings our original investment curve. We know investment shifts out, and we know that savings shifted back. So here's our new equilibrium, and here was our original equilibrium. And we can see that on this new diagram, I still have the interest rate going up. I can see that on both, uh, both drawings. But now I have savings and investment in equilibrium. So I'll call those equilibrium savings and investment. The S star and the I star, they went back. So really with this investment tax credit, I know that it's going to push interest rates up, but it's actually ambiguous how it's affecting equilibrium saving and how it's affecting equilibrium investment. So hopefully this video reminded you on all that important prior knowledge about how there's a difference between equilibrium investment versus investment. Investment's the curve, equilibrium investment's the quantity. It's like QD versus D. How when two shifts happen, like we saw, things can be ambiguous and you've got to you know, pay careful attention to um, how the graph could be misleading. On the other hand, how the graph is super important, so you can't just like not draw graphs. That's not going to be an option. And finally, how anything else you might remember from supply and demand models are important. Because at heart, this is just supply and demand. It's just a particular market that we're analyzing with supply and demand with particular labels. But ultimately, the model and the mechanics and solving and graphing are all the same as you learned last semester. So thanks for watching.